taken quite the hiatus here lately and I uh this video might be a shit show because I don't really have you know a set in stone script or anything this is kind of the uh, the first run back per se took a hiatus for a bit because I was just getting a little burnt out that hiatus turned into you know things changing with equipment and things like that and then once you once you kind of step out of a workflow it's it's pretty difficult to you know, get back into the flow of things. And that, that was my experience. And I figured the best way to, you know, reintroduce like what's happened over the last couple of months um, and you know, talk about kind of where my head is right now is just to, you know, do a year end, uh, talk about some of my favorite photos from this last year, talk about some of my influences, some of my favorite pieces of gear and some of the lessons I've learned and what I'm looking to do moving into 2022 and what you guys can expect going forward. Started the year with a, a Canon AE-1 and a Fuji X-Pro3. I also had a Blackmagic Pocket Cinema camera. So I started the year shooting digital and I'd occasionally shoot a roll of film. I knew it was something that I wanted to kind of do more of. But as the year wraps, you know, 12 months later, I find myself, I own one digital camera. Um, I guess two, if you include the ZV-1 that I'm filming on right now. Uh, started with the, the X-Pro3, uh, sold that at the beginning of the year and moved into a Leica M9. Loved the experience with the M9 so much, I ended up purchasing a Leica M4 to go along with that. So now that's kind of my uh, dynamic duo. If I, if I have an assignment where it's going to be a quick turnaround, I, I can take the M9 uh, and then bring the photos and do any kind of color correction processing that's needed. Um, get a preliminary edit together pretty quickly in terms of photo selection and then send that off to an editor or whatever. Um, and then for personal stuff, the M4 is just brilliant. It's everything I could have ever wanted in a camera and more. Um, it, it, it's been my dream camera and it's exceeded the expectations that I had for it. So so those are my two like 35 range finder kind of kind of cameras. I ended up giving the Canon AE-1 to um, to Audrey, and she's we're kind of like working through uh, teaching her how to shoot, and um, she's just now getting into uh, into film a little bit, and so that's been a lot of fun, kind of teaching somebody else uh, and sharing that passion, especially with somebody um, who you really care about. It's a it's a special thing. Um, so that's been fun. Uh, we're going to take, she's going to take the AE one to Italy. Um, we leave next week for that. So that'll be a lot of fun. And I'm sure there'll be some, some cool photos that we take while we're, while we're there. So I've got the M4 and the M9, uh, Zeiss 35 millimeter lens that goes back and forth. And so as you guys know, I got a Fujifilm GW690, um, for a medium format shooter. I got that camera probably, you know, five months ago and I've ended up selling that camera. The only issue, and this was really something that I couldn't prepare myself for until I had the camera, it's just too bulky. Um, you can't take the lens off, so you can't, like, tra it's not easy to travel with. I, I took it on a couple of trips with me and found myself just leaving it. Like, I didn't want to, we went on several hikes earlier this year, and I didn't want to lug it around because it was a big camera. Um, and... I find myself leaving it at home because I'd, I'd rather, you know, rather shoot with the Rolleiflex or I'd rather shoot with the Leica. And when you're sacrificing, you know, you buy a camera because you want the large, um, larger negative. And then you find yourself going with a 35 over it because it's just a pain. That's the, uh, that was kind of the breaking point. I realized, yeah, I, I don't want that camera just sitting around. So I ended up selling that. And uh, if you'll remember at the beginning of that video, 
I talked about, you know, buying that instead of a Mamiya 7. Looking very seriously into purchasing a Mamiya 7 pretty recently. Um, I, because I wanted a camera that had a, a larger negative than a 35 that I could travel with because uh, I'm going to be doing some traveling over the next several months. I just went ahead and bought a Mamiya 7 with an 80 millimeter lens and I've only shot a couple of rolls with it so far but it's a lot more compact than, than the Fuji. And the huge thing about the Mamiya is you can take the lens off. It's a lot easier to travel with. Um, so I'll be taking this to Italy with me alongside the M4. And um, yeah, I mean, you know, sometimes you, you compromise on a purchase and um, you end up regretting it. And that's kind of the situation here. Uh, I thought the GW was a, a wonderful alternative to this. And I mean, there's a reason that this is price the way it is uh, sure some of that type but it's also the most portable camera um, for the image quality that you can find so RIP to the Fuji um, so and then also still have the Rolly Flex love the Rolly um, so those are my four cameras you know M4 M9 Rolly Flex and then the Mamiya 7 and then I'm shooting on the ZV-1 every camera has a different purpose to it every camera I, I enjoy the experience of picking it up and holding it and uh, it inspires me yeah, so it's, I feel like I'm in a really good place with that. Um, if there's one, I'm looking at like Deerdorf 8x10s. <laughs> Maybe that's something I dive into like in 2022. I've never shot large format, so we'll see. But I think it's funny. I, I just took a total 180 at the beginning of the year. I was shooting mainly digital. Um, and now I'm shooting mainly film. So it's it's been a good experience, but it's also taught me some things, which I think will lead me to my next favorite piece of equipment, pieces of equipment, light meters. So <laughs> I've got just an incident meter and a spot meter. This is the uh, Pentex spot meter. And then this is the Siconic Flashmate um, incident and reflective meter. So shooting primarily digital for so long, I, I never really saw the importance of metering. You know, there's a meter in my camera. It's, uh, it's great. I just never really, you know, thought I needed a light meter. Uh, lots of people that I worked with were like, yeah, it's, it's unnecessary, whatever. And uh, for me personally, I've really enjoyed the experience of using a light meter. And maybe it's just, you know, me being less experienced than some people out there. But um, I mean, it's just given me a lot of control over my image. I can I see the world a lot differently now. And I'm able to, you know, walk out and just kind of eyeball things and see where the light needs to be and then this is just a super easy way to check it and I mean there's no excuse for getting <laughs> bad exposures um there's just too many tools out there that that can prevent that from happening so I really enjoyed the metering especially the spot metering um on landscape work this has been an absolute revelation um kind of experimenting with the the zone system and working through that it's been unbelievable Highly recommend it to anybody out there that's involved with film photography. Um, and it's going to help you with digital too. I mean, I find myself picking up the M9 or, you know, working on shoots with um, other digital cameras. And it's just, it's, you see things differently. You have a more like a broader understanding of what needs to happen, what goes into the image, how that's going to look in post, et cetera. Uh, highly recommend <laughs> light meters, underrated, underrated. And then finally, the grand um, finale of gear is something I picked up uh, probably two months ago and uh, ended up shooting a piece on. I'll put a clip of that in the video in just a moment. But this is a K3, a Krasnogorsk 3. I probably botched that. Um, 16 millimeter uh, motion picture camera. <laughs> to shoot on motion picture film since I got into filmmaking. I mean, so my entire career, I've wanted to, you know, shoot on motion picture film, 
move in that direction, especially for personal work um, and uh, narrative work, I, I, just motion picture film. There's something, you know, romantic about it. And I love the process. You know, I love having a limited amount of storage for your image that you're recording. That, so you have to kind of know. You know, everything's got to be dialed in. The light's got to be dialed in. The acting has to be dialed in. Your blocking has to be dialed in. Everything has to be accounted for beforehand. Um, so when you're going in and you know exactly what you need and you know when you got it. I love that just minimal quality of work where it's, you know, you do everything up front and then you execute. So... Several projects have inspired me a lot this year, and uh, I want to go over those uh, briefly and talk about the photographers behind those projects. So first up is Paul Graham, um, and specifically his work in A Shimmer of Possibility, uh, just kind of the, the sequencing of photographs and editing things together from a cinematic standpoint. So a lot of my work is inspired by cinema. It is a crucial part of my life, and... Um, kind of cinema and film has had a great influence on me as a person. And obviously that translates into the work that I'm creating because it's personal work. Um, Paul Graham, though, just how he sequences images to kind of convey those feelings of, you know, first of all, the passage of time, but also that cinematic quality to the image. And, um, you know, you're intercutting ideas and characters that are then having thoughts about other things it's it's just fascinating work and it had a massive influence on me at the beginning of this year and it's kind of trickled down throughout the year um and so i'll show some of his stuff here Next up, we've got um, William Eggleston. So I grew up in Nashville, Tennessee. I grew up three minutes from Vanderbilt's campus, uh, and that's where William Eggleston went to school. So he did several photography, um, or he did a lot of photography around that area. Um, but he's most well known for his work in his hometown of Memphis, and he's got years and decades, decades and decades of, um, of work and collections of work from that area. But he's always been one of my favorite um, photographers, you know, just coming from Tennessee. And um, his work has always been really influential. I kind of knew about him before I knew about anybody else, if that makes sense. Um, and it's just always had an impact on me. But this year, um, William Eggleston's Guide uh, has had and like hard to describe the influence it's had. Um, I've spent a lot of time this year. I don't, I don't know why. Maybe it's because of COVID and just the changes around me. But. I spent a lot of time reflecting on kind of nostalgia, the passage of time, um, time that's lost, you know, childhood, uh, these ideas. And um, I found myself on several occasions, you know, trying to like watch cartoons that I enjoyed as a kid or rewatch, you know, movies or reread books or stories or listen to music that I, that I had this magic quality to it when I was a child and almost trying to recapture that. And I don't know why um, I'm very happy with where I am in life and um with what's going on around me, but there's just this weird relationship that we have with, with our childhood and with nostalgia. And I've, I've spent time trying to kind of capture that in the past year and I've, I've noticed it and it, it's taken influence in my work, but going back to William Eggleston's guide, that book is just, that project is just so brilliantly conveyed, edited by John Tchaikovsky of MoMA, but it's, um, it's just such a brilliant representation of like aging like the magic quality of childhood and leaving that behind for like the scary and unruly world of adulthood and um just the dirtiness and i don't, I don't know <laughs> first of all it's william michelson so the work is great but just something about that how it's edited uh there's there's an essay um a video essay by alex soth uh that talks about kind of his thoughts on that and um specifically like Eggleston's Democratic Forest and highly, 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 highly recommend checking that out. But that book has just, uh, that project has just had an 
unreal influence on me over the over the last year. forward um, Stephen Shore uh, specifically the nature of photographs and uncommon places um, I've listened to a lot of like his his lectures and just you know you put it on you listen to it and then uh, you, you <laughs> the next day you start it over and you listen to it again and then you listen to it again and each time you get a little new nugget out of it and that's kind of how I digest things um, but I've, I've just been listening to him constantly throughout the year um, it's been a reoccurring influence, you know, like not a month has gone by, I don't think, where his work hasn't somehow reintroduced itself to me. Um, but specifically, the nature of photographs and uh, uncommon places are those are just two unbelievable projects that really digest the ways of just like seeing the world um, or like looking in different ways of just kind of like observing and capturing our like gaze through a photograph. Um Highly check, recommend checking those out. I'll, show, I'll share a little bit of the work here, but those projects have been um, very uh, paramount in my mind over the past year. Joel Meyerwitz, Cape Light. Uh, I've revisited that project several times, and um, that's that's had a, an influence on me. And then Gary Winogrand, just his entire body of work. Um, I, I, I've always known about Gary, but this year I kind of developed a new relationship with his work, and that's been really exciting. And then uh, two more contemporary photographers. Um, I would say Daniel Arnold. Um, he does fashion photography um, and street photography, I guess editorial um, fashion and street photography. And um, he works out of New York City. I believe he's still in New York City, but um, he's got a lot of his work is online and you can find it. And it's just, <laughs> you know, it's, it's exciting. And um, I, I've really found uh, just the, the way he can kind of identify moments and capture like, just fleeting moments that you know will never happen again but he cat like the fraction of a second uh, he's able to capture it that's that's been really uh, influential in my work and then um matt black so matt black is a magnum photographer and um i've been looking through uh, a project that he did um called uh, american geography and <laughs> it's unreal like unbelievable uh, i've always had a, a deep kind of interest in just like poverty in America and kind of socioeconomic diversity amongst like different uh, sections of people. So I grew up in the South and I've, you know, I've been directly with, you know, kind of living in uh, communities that are, uh, you know, I guess lower class or whatever. Um, and then I've also seen the complete opposite of that. So I think it's interesting uh, when you can kind of see both sides of the perspective and uh, just how, you know, people in that proletariat um, class or whatever you want to call it, how some opportunities that are seen as like personal failures are actually uh, more systemic than they are um, intrinsic. So just super interesting work there. Uh, highly recommend checking out Matt Black and I'll, I'll of course, throw some of his work here.
So yeah, as for influences, that about covers it. Uh, so we've talked about gear, we've talked about influences, we've talked about moving forward. Um, <laughs> I guess what, favorite film stock? I've been shooting a lot of Portra 800, um, a lot of Portra 400 for the medium format work. And uh, I'm starting to try, try X a little bit. So we'll see how that goes. But Portra 800 for the 35 work and Portra 400 for the uh, larger stuff. Also trying some Portra 160, but, you know, tried and true. 800, 400. That's it. And um, I, I just feel comfortable shooting that as of right now. I don't think I've taken a lot of really good photos this year. Um, and some of that is just, you know, not taking advantage of opportunities to get out and photograph more. Uh, there's been more, you know, um, business type work or commercial type work that that's been done that I, you know, it is what it is. It pays the bills, but it doesn't, um, it doesn't, you know, push me forward as, as an artist. Um, it doesn't bring me to a new place or a new understanding of the world around me. So, uh, but I will put a couple of photos that I've, I've enjoyed. Other influences, I feel like I should briefly touch on this. So uh, a lot of cinema influences me. Um, I've really been, you know, diving into like Billy Wilder movies. Uh, I watch a lot of American westerns. Uh, I don't know why those are so fascinating to me. Um, who else have I been watching? Let's. Oh, uh, Ziga Vertov. So I watched Man with a Movie Camera. This is the one to talk about. Uh, Man with a Movie Camera by Ziga Vertov. Um, and then I immediately picked up the book um, by Ziga called uh, Kino I, and it's just a collection of essays and things like that. That film just shook me to my core when I saw it. There's a, uh, a version with a uh, score, an original score, and then there's a contemporary score. I recommend them both. Um, I prefer the contemporary score just because it feels very gritty and modern. And <laughs> I really like that idea of, you know, something out of time where the score changes and the music um when you recontextualize the the images through the music the images feel contemporary too so um man with a movie camera by ziga veritov um that might be the most influential film for me um that i've seen this year <laughs> I am always, I feel like I'll always be making videos for this channel. So if, if you're like considering, should I subscribe? He does, he, he goes on like long droughts. Uh, that's just kind of how I work. Um, I don't, at a certain point I get burnt out with what I'm doing and I feel like I need to reintroduce some new things, um, go explore on my own and step away from that external influence and, you know, work through have conversations with myself, work through ideas on my own, um, read that, that includes reading, watching movies, just kind of looking at the world around me and not being caught up in what's going on. Um, whether that's on the internet or, um, on YouTube, et cetera. Also not voicing an opinion, you know, sometimes it's good to step back, not have any opinion and just let things kind of exist how they are and observe those things. And that's, that's what I like doing. So there's always going to be hiatus periods, I think. Um, I mean, who knows? But right now, that's my headspace. I have taken two, like three month hiatuses in, in the short, you know, year and a half I've been making videos. So 
feels like that's just going to be a thing. And I, I sincerely apologize if that, if that, you know, turns you off in the idea of subscribing, then I totally understand. But I think that's just going to be kind of a part of, of what this is going forward. I just wanted to say uh, thank you guys for the growth on the channel um, and just thank you for everything. And I'm really looking forward to kind of getting back into the rhythm of creating videos and, um, you know, just, you know, getting used to talking in front of the camera again. But we'll edit this down. This is going to be chaotic, so I apologize ahead of time. But um, yeah, it's been uh, it's been a great ride. It's been a good year and I'm looking forward to an even better one next year. Um, you know, want to, want to experiment with, uh, new things for sure. But also I finally feel like I'm at a place where I'm, I'm kind of content. You know, I have, I have the cameras I want to work with. I don't really have a, a want in me to like change that out. Um, so, you know, getting out of this, this mindset of acquiring things and getting back to the mindset of, um, just creating great work and, uh, trying to create great work and um, trying to create work that I think is great. I mean, obviously, that's a completely subjective thing. So anyways, guys, I really appreciate you, and I hope you're having a wonderful um, start to your holiday season. But if I don't see you before then, uh, I hope you have a wonderful holiday with your families and uh, enjoy the time together. And uh, yeah, until next time. One, two, three.